we climate scientists are not that bad at math. We know that 10 does not equal 10,000, so there must be something missing, right? Hi, my name is Nina Mahendl. I'm a doctoral researcher at Leipzig University and today's video is about how ice clouds are formed and why there's much more ice crystals than math would tell us. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Remember last video I talked about what clouds are made of. You did not watch last video? Um, you can check it out right here if you want. You're still here, right? All right, then let me give you a brief reminder. Clouds consist of either tiny liquid droplets or tiny ice crystals or both. So what we see as a um, cloud are actually many, many individual droplets or crystals. They're too small for us to see with the eye, but the sum of them blocks enough light such that the cloud looks opaque. Here I want to focus on ice crystals because A, in my own research, I'm particularly interested in the Arctic and due to the cold temperatures, clouds typically have a lot of ice in them. And B, ice crystals just look more pretty than chocolate, so of course they must be more important, right? Just kidding. Okay, now we know that some clouds consist of ice crystals, but how did the crystals get there in the first place? Ice crystals form from water vapor or liquid droplets when temperatures are below freezing. For water vapor to turn to ice or liquid, the air must be super saturated, meaning a certain threshold of humidity must be reached. The threshold depends on temperature, so on air temperature. It's lower the lower the temperature, meaning colder air can hold less moisture, less water vapor than warm air. I'm sure you all know hot, humid summer days. We've had plenty of them in Leipzig this summer, but there's not really cold, humid winter days. So if an almost saturated air mass is cooled down, it typically becomes super saturated. And in principle, if we have temperatures below freezing, ice can form. Below minus 38 degrees Celsius, that happens by liquid droplets freezing. Above minus 38 degrees Celsius, liquid water stays liquid in a super cooled state. Super cooled, super saturated, yes, we like to put super in front of words. It's just more practical, more fun to say than more than. So between zero and minus 38 degrees Celsius, ice does not form from water vapor or liquid droplets alone. It needs something to cling on to. And that something are tiny, tiny particles in the air called aerosol particles. I'm sure you've heard of the term aerosol before. Examples are soot particles that get emitted from car engines or by wildfires, desert dust that gets lifted in the air, pollen or sea salt close to the oceans. Not every type of aerosol can act as a so-called nuclei, so where ice cling, cling onto. That subset of aerosol particles we call ice nucleating particles, or INP, if you want to use cool sciencey jargon. Which aerosol particles and how many of them can act as INP depends on chemical composition of the particles, their size and the air temperatures. Um, there's different ways in which INP can lead to the formation of ice. So let's make a short list. Uh, one, in supersaturated air, water vapor can directly deposit on an IMP forming ice that's called deposition ice nucleation. Um, so it completely skips the liquid phase. Two, an IMP can get immersed in a liquid, in a supercooled liquid water droplet and trigger freezing that way. That's called immersion freezing. Fun fact, that's basically what happens when we make ice cubes in the freezer. So the tap water always contains some amount of tiny particles, which act then as the nuclei 
where freezing starts. And free. A super cool droplet can also freeze instantly when it comes into contact with an IMP that's then called contact freezing. By now I bet you're wondering what that has to do with faulty math as I suggested in the video title and at the beginning of this video. Let's get to that. We can measure the number of IMP in the atmosphere. We can also measure the number of ice crystals in the atmosphere. For example, in measurement campaigns where scientists for example, fly with an aircraft through clouds and collect data of IMP and ice crystals that way. And that's where you get to the problem. Because the number of IMP is typically much, much smaller than the number of ice crystals. Now, we climate scientists are not that bad at math. We know that 10 does not equal 10,000, so there must be something missing, right? Like another way for ice to form or one could also say a secondary way for ice to be produced. How could that be called? You guessed it, creative scientists call it secondary ice production, or SIP, SIP, because we love abbreviations. Secondary ice is a hot topic in cloud science at the moment, because it's still rather poorly understood. There's many research projects or studies and trying to gain a better understanding on secondary ice production via model studies, um, studies in a laboratory or collecting observational data. There's different mechanisms that have been proposed to produce secondary ice. Um, let me list the ones we think are most important, but by the way, this list is not complete. Uh, one, when droplets freeze, they can shatter and some fragments of ice get thrown in the air. Two, when a super cooled liquid droplet gets into contact with an ice crystal, it freezes immediately, but there some parts of the ice can splinter off. And three, when ice crystals collide with each other, that can also lead to some fragments just breaking off. Questions that are subject to ongoing research are, which of these processes is most important, under which conditions, and how much ice does get produced that way. It's currently a problem that many different studies disagree on answers to this question, but it makes it all the more exciting. So I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you did, please leave me a like and subscribe so that you don't miss on the next video. Next time I'll be talking about what it's like spending some time in the Arctic on a research campaign. So pretty exciting. If you have questions or suggestions for video topics, please leave me a comment. It would be much, much appreciated. Think of it that way. You could be the first person to get a dedicated video to your topic of interest. That would be something, huh? Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of the day, stay safe and bye bye! And because you stayed to the end of the video, here's a little thank you from my cute kitty. Thank you, Kyoshi.